Hey, listen, I, first of all, I want, I want to thank you. I want to be respectful of your time. But I want to thank you for coming out. And I also want to, you know, we, we, should, we should have a lot more people here. Uh, but it's my own fault because, like, two days ago or three days ago, I'm like, hey, let's do let's do these little things. We probably should have been planning it two weeks ago. But that's better for you because you get more time and more questions, um, and it's not spread out all over time. So, but, but my, my promise is we'll be doing a lot more of these because I think it's, it's helpful. Number one, it's great for small businesses. They like having people come in, of course. Two, it's in a, in a, in a, a place that we can – that's not being you – know, people are being rude and shouting down and stuff like that. You can actually ask questions. And, uh, and hear from me, so we want to make sure that we do that. But most importantly, I want to know what's going on. I want to talk to people in the district all the time. And you know, I, every time I'm home, I make I make sure that I'm all around in, in, in stores and restaurants and talking to people and, and to get a good feeling of what's going on and how I can help, and how I can be more impactful for you in Washington. Um, before I open up for questions, just I, I want to say just briefly, um, just a couple things. Number one, it's an honor to serve you. Um, I have a great team. As many of you know, we kept some of Congressman Rizzo's people here in the district and in Washington, which was great because we didn't skip a beat. So in terms of case work and stuff, or, or veteran and stuff, and Social Security and things like that, the people here really know what they're doing. They've been doing it for, for a while. So, um, and in D.C., the same thing. We kept some people there who knew what they were doing so that we didn't have to. Uh, there are some offices, freshman offices, that really took them a little while, and they're still sort of getting their feet under them. We didn't skip a beat. Um, we, yeah. I ran on three main things, stronger military, veterans issues, nice. and, um, and economy and jobs, right? So on, on the military thing, you, know, you guys know we just passed a big spending bill, which I don't like a lot of the spending that was in it, but the greater good was dealing with the military and making sure that they had that infusion of cash that is very much needed because, because of sequestration. And many of you guys know this. It's hurt our maintenance, our readiness. Our training, our deployment schedules have been extended, which hurts our families. And so many of you here are veterans, and you also, many of you are in veteran families, and, and you know how that affects the families. So I'm, I'm happy that we did that. Not happy with all the spending, but I will tell you that it's important if you're a fiscal conservative like me, you need all, and especially the House, you need all Republicans to have a seat at the table. There are some bills that you want me to say no, no, no to. There are other bills that you want me to be there uh, trying to push it as conservative as possible. That is one of them because one of our fundamental duties, of course, is to fund the government and the military. So you know the bill is getting passed, and if you start off with minus 30 Republican votes, all that simply does is move the votes to the left or the, or the bill to the left, which means more spending. Um, so, But we got money that we needed. We also need to get back to what's called regular order, which I'm advocating for uh, both in the Republican conference and in Washington. And what that is, just really briefly, the government's funded on 12 appropriations bills. What we just passed was what's called an omnibus. What happens there is all these things at the last minute get passed, and that lends itself to pork, right? What needs to happen, and what hasn't happened for over a decade, is the Congress should pass each appropriations bill separate. So if one fails, it doesn't shut the whole government down, which is what, what happened, right? You had a government shutdown for three days. The National Guard in Virginia alone lost over half a million dollars. They had to cancel training for a bunch of people. There were people who had real pain because they, they take off from their, their day job, don't get paid there, go to work at, at, on the guard, and then they don't get paid there. They get sent home. This government shut down. It's irresponsible to shut it down for, at this point, it was really a Clean Dream Act. It was what, uh, on the other side, they were holding it up for. Completely irresponsible to shut down the American government for that. However, um, we so we got it done, got it back, and we are pushing towards what's called regular order. The House will... We did, this past year, for the first time in over a decade, pass all 12, but then it, st it stalled in the Senate. They wouldn't pick it up. We're going to work on that again, and this time I'm an advocate for pushing to get defense done first, That's for, which is the hard one, but we should we, we should do the hard things. We didn't go there to do easy things. Um, so anyways, that's on the strong military. On the veterans front, my first bill that was passed, less than 5% of bills in the House are passed. We already passed one. Our first one was passed two. We've got two more coming up. The first, my first bill was a VA accountability bill. I, like I said, I know there are veterans in here. The, one of my first meetings was in the Hampton VA, and they were performing at a one star out of a five star rating, which obviously is unacceptable. And what they did to remedy that was they took the, the head and they just swapped them out somewhere else. So basically, we gave our problem child to some other veteran somewhere else, right, with no accountability. Doesn't make any sense. So now, of the bill that we passed, and now Senator Tiller, uh, Tillis from North Carolina is taking it up in the Senate, 
would require the, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, he or she would have to personally sign <coughs> off on moving senior leadership and also send a report to Congress so that there's accountability there. Also on the VA front, amongst other things, I can talk about that all day, but I want to get to your questions. 63% um, of the people who use the Hampton VA are from the south side. The Veterans Affairs Veterans Affair says that 40%, there will be a 40% more increase of veterans that fall into the system over the next decade, 60% more care. So we're already behind the power curve in terms of care. This area has the fastest growing veteran population in the nation, women veterans, OIF, OEF veterans. So there was a outpatient center for the south side that's been authorized for a while, but there was no champion, champion that was pushing it. We've had that decision maker in my office five times. We've been pushing and pushing and pushing. We've worked with the city of Virginia Beach to be ready for when the, if they put a competitive bid out that the city has their ducks in a row to be able to have a package that, that they hand over to the VA and, and, and basically the VA can't say no to it. That's in, that's in movement. In about, in about a month and a half or so, sometime within that, you're going to hear an announcement of competitive bid for that care center. Most likely if Virginia Beach gets it, it'll be down in the Princess Anne area around the medical stuff there. It's 155,000 square feet. You're talking about closing down the smaller places that are over capacity, helping veterans. There'll be a couple hundred, few hundred jobs actually probably. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good deal all around. On the economic front, just really briefly, of course, the, uh, you know, we've, we've done a, I think the Congress as well as the administration has done a good job of taking some of the burdensome regulations off the economy, which has really helped. Obviously tax reform too, which has helped businesses, it's helped individuals. Um, they have, they're keeping more money in their pocket, which is important to me. I, like I said, I, I, when I'm home, I'm out very often, and people come up to me and talk to me about, you know, I had a single mother, for example, and Froggies. You, got, you guys have been to Froggies Cantina on the Shore Drive? She came up to me and she said, you know, I'm getting $70 more in my paycheck every two weeks. I can tell you, as a, as a guy who was raised by a single mother who made no, hardly any money, 500 bucks or so every two weeks with four kids in the house, $70 every two weeks in your pocket, is the difference between paying the mortgage or not, or keeping the lights on. I've also gotten from small businesses, too. We all know Century Concrete. Preston White sent me a nice letter that, talk, that went over how his, his employees are going to be benefiting from it and how it prompted him to, to invest in a new excavator, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some of the smaller businesses, it's taken a little longer to figure out how it's helping them, as opposed to the big, the big boys and girls like the Verizons and the, you know, the Apples and stuff like that that are reinvesting. So... Uh, and that's on the economic front. So military, veterans, economic, there's many other things that we work on. You mentioned the Chesapeake Bay when I first came in here. I can tell you that you know that the president's budget zeroed the Chesapeake Bay money out for the Clean Bay. Everyone in, in Virginia, I think, Republicans and Democrats, supported that, that coming back. But the reality is I want appropriations where the money is. So myself, and actually i got to give credit where credit's due, Congressman Duff Schreppersberger, who's a Democrat from Maryland, on appropriations, we went right to the chairman. This is a priority. We need a clean bay, you know, obviously for recreation, but also economic vitality for here. Uh, and it's, it's not partisan. We, we need help with it. So we were able to restore that. So we work on many, many things, and, uh, and I could talk to you all night about the stuff that we're working on, but I want to know what you want to know about, and I want to answer your questions. So who's got questions? Don't be timid. Somebody's got to break the seal. Yes, sir. Scott, thank you for fighting against sanctuary cities, first of all. You know, I've been on our k for 30 years, and I've printed two T-shirts about this stuff, and I'm against it, I'm for it. But I, what is really important to me is that the wall gets built. And hopefully you'll fight with Trump to get the money so we can build that wall. Okay, important to me. so let me talk to you about that. So I'm on, I'm on again, I'm on appropriations, and one of my subcommittees is Homeland Security, right? So obviously that was a big, uh, big point in the election. One of the first trips I did when I got into Congress was go to the damn border to understand what's what's going on down there. So I went to four different sectors of the border. They're a little bit different. Like there's the, um, there is a big need for technology in terms of surveillance in some areas. There's a need for people in some areas. There's a need for wall in some areas. Some some areas not right. If you look at McAllen, Texas, for example, you got about 100 miles as the crow flies, but about 300 miles of Snake River, right? You, it's, it's, they're very difficult to put, a, obviously, a wall there. Yeah. The same thing with where you have mountains on, on some of the sure. stuff. So on the wall itself and on the funding itself, the fiscal, the, the bill that we first, that we just passed, number one, we, we, we put, I think it's over a decade, more of a plus up in Homeland Security and Border Patrol than in the past decade for the last, the last fiscal year 18. There was also about $1.6 billion worth of 
wall funding, if you will, right. uh, for the next six months, because right. now we're on fiscal year 19. Right. And that is up and above what the, the, what the Trump, Trump administration asked for, actually. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation out there, like, oh, you don't want to fund the you know. Like, I, I'm for border security. I, th I think you have, if you're a sovereign nation, you have to have a border. You have to have security there. I've been to 40-some 40, 40 countries in the world. Every single country that has that's more prosperous than the one next to it mm -hmm. has an immigration problem. I was in Yemen. They had an immigration problem with Ethiopian folks that were coming over looking for jobs. I don't know why the hell you would go to Yemen to look for jobs, but some people do. All right? So, so my point is this. I'm for more security, and, and I'll, support, I'll support it. Where, where it's necessary. I think the president himself understands that, you know, I know that there's, you know, the, the talking point, but I think he understands what I just explained, that at some part, like, where there's a mountain, you don't need a wall, right? 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 And um, so I think he understands that and agrees with it. And one more point. Uh, first, thank you for your service. For your service is a service. But thank you so much. Your service now again means Thanks. a lot to me. And my wife's a school teacher. She got an extra $160 a month in her paycheck, too. And Fantastic. thank you for that as well. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good funny. Yes? Yes? Yeah, I just want to thank you. Um, I'm in law enforcement. Every time. My family's in law enforcement. And I, I've seen a, a dramatic change with the new administration that came in. With the last administration, it seemed that it was cool to be against the police. It was cool to back the police. Um, I'm not seeing that right now. I'm seeing the pro-police. The president goes out and speaks on behalf of law enforcement. Um, he's actually reached out to some of the survivors some of the officers that have been killed in the line of duty. And uh, you've always done that, but we want you to know it's more important. We thank you for, for what the change has been. Uh, look, we appreciate you guys. Look at it, you know, you. law enforcement, the rule of law, is part of the fabric of society. You have that broken down, you don't have society. You know what I mean? It, it only takes one natural disaster or war or something like that to, to, to look, and you can see that historically too. Uh, when you look at Katrina, you know, when there's no rule of law there, you know, humans can be kind of bad sometimes, right? So we have to have law law enforcement. And I, I think like I, I'm all about ensuring that bad apples in law enforcement are weeded out. Just like if I was in the SEAL team. If you're a bad apple, get the heck, get out. Absolutely. However, the, you know, obviously 99.9% .9 of law, law enforcement, they're doing the right thing. They're putting their lives on the line for us every single day. Even the people that might not like them, if they get the call, they're going to go in a building and get them and save them, which is, it, which is amazing to me. So... Look, we appreciate everything you guys do, and uh, I'm, I'm always going to be supportive of the rule of law and law enforcement. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is there any plans working in Washington right now to make that? There are no plans working in Washington. Anybody thinking about uh, continuing making the tax cut permits? Uh, yes. Five, yes. Five, uh, five, as a matter of fact, there is a bill to do that for the individual, which I'm already a co-sponsor of, right? So. That there is a bill, it's just a question of when the timing is. So there was, you know, there was talk about doing it like during tax, you know, like during the tax season. But as you can imagine, in Washington, some days before 10 a.m., there's already like three crazy things that have, you know, that are taking up the news cycle. But so the time, I don't know when the timing is, but there's absolutely movement for that, and there will be a bill on the floor that makes this tax cut permanent. So all, so all the folks that are. Um, that are messaging against tax reform. And I think, I, and there are commercial out right now that's got, you know, some, some guy saying, hey, I'm a veteran, I did this, but I'm a veteran. Oh, and Scott voted for the tax scam, which is really ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, and and those, those same folks that are, that are using that as a messaging thing saying, well, they're not, they don't want it to be permanent. They're, you know, they're helping all the rich, of course, and they don't want it to be permanent. Well, let's, let's see them put their money where their mouth is when that vote comes to the floor. It's coming. Answer your question? Yeah. Yep. That's good, thank you. Where their mouth was when the tax bill came through, right? Basic on the floor? Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I hope I got so apologize for that. Um, oh, I like it. You got, you got the notes on it. Because my daughter tried to come see you um, at school, and so these are her talking points, and some are for other people, and some are. Um, more personal, but okay. So one thing was, I know um, I have a good friend that she works in the foster care system, and she's been a foster care parent for years. She has five kids of her own. Um, they're all in the Navy. Mm -hmm. All her kids, along with her husband. Um, so this was uh, during her bar, along with some other friends that I know, working volunteer connected with the Wish down in Virginia Beach. Um, so the kids get about $300 a year to spend on clothing, whatever they need. And in some circumstances, they have to spend it at one day at one store, like at Walmart. They don't get an allowance throughout the year for <coughs> their personal needs. Um, so that's, to me, this seems like that's not, especially for the older kids, um, who technically don't 
get into the project of programs. So that was something that they kind of brought up. Um, another thing was that, and I think you had thought about um, trying to get um, either two years paid for for community college for foster care students or kids, um, but would you be willing to consider giving them an opportunity to go to a full funded, accredited college versus going to a two year community school? The other thing is they have, um, sorry, they have, they get, um, they get mental health care that they have to provide their own transportation to get to. Um, and considering about 42% of the kids in the system have mental health issues, this is the way they were brought up, the problems that went on in their home, um, abusive situations, would it be easier for them to have mental health opportunities right there in a school that, like a public school system, if they're elementary, middle school, or high school, so they don't have to provide, or the foster care parents don't have to bring them to mental health services if there's something that would be easier for them? So I think that that would be easier. However, I think in general, we have to figure out, you know, <laughs> I'm not aware exactly where the funding streams are. Mm -hmm. Is that is at is at the state level? Is it the federal level? Is it a combination of both? You know, so I'd have to look at the totality of what you're saying right. to figure out where those things are. Obviously, look, I'm a I was an at risk kid. Um, the only reason why you guys are even speaking to me is because I had a big you know big brothers big sisters. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on probation when I was like 12 years old, and I was an at risk kid, right? So I have a hard for for that. You know, for, right. for for those types of programs that are not just mental health, but just you know mentorship programs and things mm -hmm. like that. That an investment in, in our youth because if you don't if you if you have a situation like that mm -hmm. and the foster care same thing foster care adoption I just ran the top of the to the top of the West End on the Saturday for that um, my throat's still hurting from doing that less than five minutes 37 floors it was crazy <laughs> but uh, I couldn't even move when I got up there but um but I smiled like I didn't hurt at all <laughs> it was hurt um so you know I have a heart for the, for that type of stuff because I know that a little bit of investment can change the whole trajectory of one's life like mine. And that, that's a, a huge investment for society and, and, and have kids that are become productive members of society as, as adults. Right. But to, to, I can't be real specific on what you're saying. Right. Just because I need to look at where the funding streams come from, are they state, is it federal, I don't know where those things are. Mm -hmm. And I'm not on the Committee of Jurisdiction right now in Congress. Okay. I'm happy to run it down for you specifically. Yeah, I, mean, it was just, I think it was just a matter of like just bringing attention to it. Like sure. this is what, and, and the um, woman who's president of Connect with the Wish in Virginia Beach, she gave me the numbers as far as the ones that she sees, and maybe it's just a district or the state, they get $300 a year. Um, for See, I don't, again, I don't know if that's from the state or from the feds. I just right, don't know. Right I'm happy to work with her with our office. You know, we can, we can set they something up. They would love that, actually. Sure. They would really like, they would like it a lot. You know, obviously, you have to look at the whole totality of it, mm -hmm. scarce resources, how much you can put, you know, where, where the funding streams are. So I just don't I just don't have a specific answer, but I'm more than willing to sit down and talk to her and figure out what, what's going on. Okay, my, my second thing was, and this is um, about military benefits. Um, so... Um, there are and I, there's uh, several women who've come to me and um, and just, uh, speaking to them that they are in a situation where they're getting divorced or they're separated and they aren't 2020 wives. They're either 1020 or 2015 wives. What does that mean? Um, that right? means they don't get the health care. So okay. if their spouse um, and I don't mean to say if it's man it goes both ways. If it was the, the woman that served in the man it was the spouse that if they should get into a divorce situation, that if the spouse serves the full 20, they get their full medical benefits um, forever, the spouse will lose them. So if, unless they serve the whole 20 with their spouse, they don't get to keep their medical benefits. Um, and there are some, and when I've spoken to um, uh, TRICARE Healthcare, um, that literally miss it by days, by weeks, by months, by years. Like, if you've been married, is that DOD policy or is that mm -hmm. our state? It's DOD, okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, some, even if you have a pre existing condition, even if you had past medical care, you don't get it. If you were married um, less than 15 or less than 15 years of the spouse served, you lose all your health care. You can buy into it for a year, but after that, you don't get any of it. And um, they always like to say that. The spouses that stay home are the silent service members, but they tend not to get recognized when those situations come up. 
So, I, you know, again, I'm not familiar with the marriage, the marriage law of DOD and stuff like that. It's something I, I, I'd have to also research. Um, yeah. how, however, look, I'm obviously families to me are, are the only reason why we're in the military as great as it is is because of our strong families. There's no, there's no question about that. And over, over these past wars, you, you know, you've, you've seen families and they've really bore the burden of the struggle, not just for this area, but for the country, quite frankly. Right. A part of that less than 1% of the nation that's actually served in these wars. So, same thing, like I got to run it down and, and I understand what, what, where the policies are and then, and then make a decision on what, if there is an action where we should move it to or not. And I'm willing to sit down and talk about it. I'm just not familiar with those things specifically. Okay. But great questions. Makes me think, and now I got to run it back. One of you guys in the office better be taking notes. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Entirely different subject. What do you think? No problem. I'm, I'm ready. What do you think is going to happen with the Mueller probe? You know, I, I think, so I, listen, I, I, I've been on record saying, you know, let, let it play out, right? I know, I, I understand that the feeling of people are saying, hey, it's out of the scope, right? What he's doing is out of the scope and stuff like that. At the same time, there's asymmetric information in terms of there are things that he knows that we don't know, right? Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know what he's. I don't know what information he has. I have no idea. Um, that then I, so somebody asked me today at the, the, one of these other things on the shore, and they said, "Are you going to do something to protect Mueller?" Right? No. I think that we. I think our system works. Right? I think there's a. It, there's a it's a very political move to go and say, "Hey, we're going to we're going to protect, protect Mueller as the president, saying that he's going to fire him." Maybe, maybe he is. Maybe he isn't. And there's all this you know, news and stuff like that. I think it would be politically very, uh, it would be a very poor decision politically for the president to do that. I think that would cause him more problems than not. I don't think he's going to fire Mueller, um, and, and I don't think that you need, I don't think that you need to add a wall uh, for that to, to do it. In terms of, and RK and I were talking just a little earlier, in terms of like collusion, I think there's nothing there. It, was there some low-level guy that may have talked to somebody or something like that? Yeah, maybe, maybe. But do I think that there was, I worked with the Trump campaign during the primary. So all this stuff that you even look, I have an opponent that's like, I'm Trump, 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 that's complete BS. We were the first ones, if you guys remember, that were bringing the president here, you know, to Virginia Beach. I was in the White House last week, was in the, in the White House the week before that, right? We're working on a bill with him. But I work with the campaign, and the campaign was pretty disorganized, to be honest, right? There's no way they were doing, you know, they were, no way, no way. And I think, uh, hold on a second, so I think one of the things I want to say is, if you're Russia, this has been the most successful, successful uh, disinformation campaign in the history of the world, quite frankly. Look at our country right now. If you're Vladimir Putin, you're pretty damn happy right now. Not saying, not because Trump won. You're happy because our country is so divided right now politically. And his country internally, domestically in Russia, is not divided. So what's happening? So because in, internally in his country where he's not divided, he's able to then externally do things. And he is all over the place. And America is divided, and Russia, 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 and all stuff like that. This, this right here has been the most successful disinformation campaign in the history of the world by Russia, and it's and it's dangerous. It's dangerous for our country. But do I think there was collusion with with the president and Russia? No, I don't. I, just don't. I don't know that Russia did anything, but the media said Russia did everything. The, no, they they, the they Hillary Clinton right. said Russia did everything, where the Democratic Party has been known to stick their finger in places that don't have holes in the dike and create them. Uh, I think they, I think they, okay, I think that this is what I, this is what I know that they, that they did do. Well, they did, uh, they did have disinformation campaigns on social media. That's, that's widely agreed upon. Now, do I think that that changed our election results? No, not even close. I don't think that I voted for the president as opposed to Hillary Clinton because of Russia. I don't think anybody in the whole country voted because of Russia. Like, I don't think so. They, but, but what I'm saying is they also did some uh, pro-Hillary stuff as well. So again, I think that, that the Russian disinformation campaign was the most successful in the, in the world, or in history, because of look at our country. Now, the, the Russia Russia did, I, I, by, via proxy, that I do think they I, I know that they did try to hack into some election machines and stuff like that. The good thing about American elections, and so the good and the bad thing, we're so, you know, it's obviously ran by the states, so it's unbelievably hard to say we're going to hack the whole election. You just can't, right? You can't do it. Um, I do think we should think about, in terms of machines, I think Virginia did this this year, where we're going to go to paper ballots. That's important, because I do believe that there were, there were hackers that were involved in those things. I know that there were, and I don't think they're going away. However, I think this also lends itself, so I had a conversation with, uh, with Senator Warner. 
we were talking about this. As you know, Senator Warner's on the, he's the ranking member of the Intel thing, so for him, Russia, 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 right? And I said, Mark, the, 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 you're going to look dumb. Uh, you know, in, in, in some respects, because I because I think that you're getting swept up into this in this Kool Aid. But the bigger problem here is, if you're able to remove yourself and look at this objectively, is the United States doesn't have a policy in cyber. We have no policy. What does it mean if what's an act of war in cyberspace? What is an act of aggression? What is an act of disruption, which would be election stuff, gas pipelines, financial stuff like that? Gone are the days that you have a because every single every single attack from now on will have some sort of cyber component to it, right? And if you look at cyberspace, 90% of cyberspace is in private hands. So no longer are we, is it a military and civilian target. Those days are gone, right? But we have no policy of what it, what it means for active war, active aggression, active disruption. What happens if someone hacks our elections or actually, actually changes the outcome? We know Russia has been involved in elections for decades. They've supported local communist parties in different countries and stuff like that for decades. Now they can just do it on a much higher level. And moving forward with, with increasing computing power, they're going to be able to do it more. So what's important for America, not just for Republicans or Democrats or all this Russia, Russia stuff, is creating a policy that protects the integrity of our elections and tells the world what they won't do. If, if you're familiar with the Monroe Doctrine, James Monroe, no European, uh, back, back in the day, of course, no European troops in the, in the, in the Western Hemisphere. And what that, what that doctrine did was allow the executive to have flexibility to, to maneuver, but it told the world what they wouldn't do. You need the same thing in cyber. You need, to see, you need a cyber Monroe doctrine that tells the world what they won't do. And messing with our election integrity is actually absolutely one of them. So what's getting lost in all this stuff, in, the, in this political partisan BS, is the bigger thing. And that's protecting the integrity of our elections. Yes, ma'am. I see things on the internet that are doing away with the Electoral College, and I hope that doesn't happen. There's no serious move to do that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and the second thing is, they're going after Trump, but nobody's going after Hillary, because Comey said it's okay, that nobody's going to indict her I still for think. destroying 30,000 emails that were subpoenaed. No, sorry. Go ahead. Is anything going to happen? So, so there are some things that I don't know that I don't control. We, RK and I were speaking about this just a little bit earlier. I'm not on the oversight committee, and I'm not on the intel committee, where you're seeing a lot of with Nunez and Gowdy and some of these other folks. Good lad, is, you know, uh, when they're when they, they actually they referred some some uh, criminal charges in some of those some of those things, but the Congress doesn't prosecute, right? DOJ's got to have a hand. So I know it's frustrating for a lot of people, including myself, um, you know, and, and not because of politics, right? I'm not, like, with the Hillary, for example. I saw what she did, just like all you guys, and I know you have veterans in here. We would be done. Done. <laughs> done. Kicked out of the military, up on charges, no question about it. So I, I don't, you know, I, I have a big problem with that. But that has to go through, like, the, the DOJ. Congress is working on it. There are investigations, no question about it. And I'll tell you, I read the memos, right? So you had these memos that were part, you know, that what was supposedly partisan, and I, I read both of them. And no disrespect to Democrats, but theirs was completely partisan. The Republicans wasn't. You read it, the first line of the of the, para, of the first paragraph of this memo was partisan. The Republicans wasn't partisan. At all. There was a there was a flaw in it. After I read both memos, I agree there was a flaw in it. But I remember reading through those memos. And this was before all the McCabe stuff. And I'm like, this guy's got problems. Not from a political standpoint, but from the FBI standpoint. Look, I, we have my friends in the FBI and CIA. You can't lie under oath. You can't, you can't lack candor. That, they're, they're completely a no-no, right? You're gone. Gone. And you should be gone. So when I read that, I'm like, McCabe's got problems. Peter Strzok or whatever his name is, Lisa the Tooth. You know, I'm like, these guys have big problems. I think Comey's got problems. I don't think that you've seen the last. I know the process is probably a little slow. The IG reports coming out, stuff like that. You know, we, we want we want something to be done. I think you will see something done. I think Comey has problems legally. I think McCabe does, and I think Peter and Lisa, whatever they, their name are, and a minimum, they're probably going to be gone from the FBI, and a maximum, there's going to be potential criminal charges. That's not a political statement. That's just someone who understands classified information and how, how that stuff all works. And speaking to people that are in the FBI. Yes. So, Scott, you know, we talk about a lot, and I, and I guess what's confusing a lot of people that talk to, to, talk to me about it is this. You, 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 Russia, Russia, Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. And that's how this whole thing got started. But yet, the DNC and the Hillary can't take that 
It was lies. And I guess for the public, they're going, wait a second. We know that she paid for it, which is Russia, Russia, Russia. We know it was a lie, Russia, Russia, Russia. An investigation is based on a lie, Russia, Russia, Russia. I guess that's the frustration. So what this, this is going to be in between, in between your questions, right? Yeah, right. So when you look at the dossier, and I know that there's so, the, the problem is, is all the politics around it, right? But there's only two people that were allowed to, to read. You only have two people from the, from the Republican Congress that could read the application for the FISA uh, thing, right? And so Nunez got a lot of crap on the media. Like, well, he didn't even read it. Well, he decided he decided to put Trey Gowdy and Ratcliffe, who was a, U, a U.S. attorney, people who actually know what, what they're what they're reading. That's what he, he he pushed them there. And like, you guys read it to understand it. You're gonna understand it better than me. And they did. And there were like three or three, I think three. If my memory serves me right, like three main things that were used to to get to get the FISA warrant from the judge. And the first thing they led with was the dossier. So you got you have pro there there are problems there because they they, they did not uh, give the full information about where it came from, who paid for it, and stuff like that. I think they did say something about another political uh, campaign or something, but they didn't give the, the, all the, the full information. That's part of the investigation in Congress that that, that contributed to um, to the findings, of course, of the of the report. Uh, but you have you, you need to have DOJ involved, man. You know, it's not you have that you have that Department of Justice do something. Scott, you know, the thing is, I guess, and you're right, and I understand that you're right, and I, I, I get it. But, you know, what I'm getting at, you've got 450 congressmen, 420 congressmen, and, and they, get, they know that we spend millions and millions of dollars on this fake dossier thing that was led with that got turned down once. But what is Congress saying behind the scenes? Wait a second. We're paying all these millions of dollars of taxpayers' money, and we know it's a fake dossier. We know that now. We know it's funded by the opposite party. So Congress has been stall, you know, stonewalled in terms of if the FBI, if they paid, how much they paid, stuff like that for, for this guy, Christopher Steele. Um, you know, their argument is, and, and again, I'm, I'm lacking some information because I don't, I don't know. You're doing good. But their, 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 their argument is that they, um, that despite the fact that, that where the dossier came from and might, there might be some salacious things that are not true, there are things in there that might be true that, sure. that, that rose to the level for them to approve a FISA warrant. I don't, I, I mean, I never saw that, so I can't really say that's complete BS. I just can't because I've seen it. I'm skeptical. Of course I'm skeptical of it. And, and yeah, there are, there are congressmen that are really upset about it. And they should be. You know, they, they should be. So I don't know where it's all going to lead. I know the people are, 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 uh, are continuing to investigate, continue to try to expose things. But you also have the other side that's, uh, that's, that's attacking politically, right? And so I, I don't know exactly where it's going to lead. Thanks for this yeah. Yes, sir. I'm going to shift gears for a second, if you don't mind. Uh, two things. One is, would you ever consider some type of proposal, um, you know, some of these other states are doing it, for disabled vet tags? You know, these, these tolls are going up right and left. They're already paying enough money in, in, in taxes to drive on the streets. That are fought for for eight years. You know, a lot of these. So that's a state issue. Like mean, with the tags and stuff like that, it's a state issue. But I'm yeah. happy to connect you with someone who. Exactly right. Yes. Who uh, who would work on that? Issue. You know, so that so that, you know, you got disabled vet tags, you go right on through. I mean, and most of the other states are doing it. I understand it's a state thing. Sure. But would you ever back that as? I know it's a sure. state thing, but. Sure. I mean, you know, the good thing about Virginia for for veterans at the state level, you know, I had the privilege of serving, at, you know, as a delegate. Mm -hmm. We had a military caucus meeting every single week, bipartisan, every week, where we worked on military potential military bills to make the state the most military friendly. Because of course we want to you know, keep here a lot of folks here. We have over 800,000 veterans in the state, um, so those are things that are worked on a lot, and there's a lot of appetite for that. So I'm, I'm happy to connect you with the, the delegate or senator to, to maybe run with that, and maybe we'll name the bill after you. Other side, other side. And yeah. the uh, excuse me. second thing is sure. uh, school safety and um, automatic weapons. What, what's What's going on with that? Okay, okay. so this is going to be a longer answer. So school safety and guns, right? I'm unlike most congressmen. I'm a little bit unique. I'm a Navy SEAL sniper, so I know guns really, really well. I'm also an asset. I protected assets, people, and facilities in Yemen for four years, right? Over like back and forth for four years. So from people with real assault rifles, real automatic weapons outside the door, right? So. I'm really, you know, I'm a little bit unique in terms of most congressmen that goes. I think you have to separate the two in terms of school safety and, and, and the gun issue and the gun yes. disputes. You separate the two. Let's talk about school safety then. So on the, on the first thing I will tell you, several years ago, remember the Bin Laden raid? Of course, we all remember the Bin Laden raid. I think it's today, right? Yep. Uh, so after the Bin Laden raid, when, when SEAL Team 6 was exposed by the Vice President, the, um, 
I had people come to me from the team and say, hey, look, our, we're worried. It's not hard to figure out where we live, where our kids go to school, stuff like that. We, we, need, we want some more safety in the school. And we would like to have a, a buzzer, right, single point access. So physical security one-on-one -on -one in a facility, single point access. You know who's coming in. Boom, that's it. Like that's, the, you know, that, that's what happens at a courthouse, right? Where my mm -hmm. law enforcement are left. You know, that, that's what you do. Yes, you know, so you know who's coming in. It was very difficult for me. In fact, it didn't happen. I mean, I was lobbying the superintendent for a little bit. And they were like, no, 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 we like our security posture. I'm like, no, you don't understand. That's like the, that's number one thing that you would do. Our people will pay for it. They still wouldn't do it. After the Parkland shooting, guess what happened in Virginia Beach? Every single school has yes. single point access. Access. So I think that's, that's, a, that's a, there are a lot of simple things to do. That's one thing. There's another thing that I advocated for when I was in the Virginia House of Delegates, I still do, and that is there, there's technology out there now. Does it prevent a, um, prevent a shooting? It's kind of like a fire alarm logic, right? A fire alarm doesn't prevent a fire, but it, it, it gives you, it saves you, mm -hmm. it gives, it alerts you to it, saves you time, and saves lives, right? Mm -hmm. So in Afghanistan, Iraq, folks were getting sniped at, right, in an urban area, and they didn't know where the bullet was coming from, right? Yes, you can imagine, it'd be very tough. There's all kinds of places. Someone created software, and that software would say within one second, yes, in fact, that's a bullet, and here's the angle and distance. So they, you know, connect it to a turret, they could return fire if they wanted to. Now, that technology has been put in, and, and much like a lot of inventions, unfortunately, have come from war, right? Um, but they took that as a sensor, now it's in, in, in buildings. So if there's an active shooter, and it's a school, and okay, on the west side, on the second floor, there's a shooting. But you might not hear it on the first floor on the east side, right? But those sensors, within one second, boom, it is a gun, uh, it is a gunshot, and that's where the shooter is. And because of software, you can go to everyone's cell phone, all the computers, and tell you what to do. And you can have drills just like you would in a fire drill or something like that. Plus, you can go to law enforcement immediately, so they so it saves time, therefore saves lives, mm -hmm. right? So that's something that I, that I had a bill actually in, in the Virginia House of Delegates for new schools. You know, Virginia Beach, we got great schools. You guys have seen them. They're pretty expensive to build. You could probably go down one level on the sconce of the lighting and have, and have this. It's not that expensive to put in. Um, and, and on that note, the we also in Virginia we. Incentive, incentivize localities to put retired law enforcement, military, in, in, the, in the school. So I'm not an advocate of you know someone walking around the damn school with it with a big gun or something like that, but a potentially concealed. And, and what I don't, the gun-free zone. I agree with the president on this. Why would you have a gun? We protect politicians. We protect our money. We protect celebrities with guns, or at least the, the notion that you, someone might have a gun. Why would we not protect our most precious resources in the same way? It makes no sense to me. So, uh, but, but on that note, that, so there are also, what have we done? So we've, we have, uh, in the Congress, because a lot of things the feds do, of course, is, is give money. And then it goes down to the states, and they, and they do their policies, and then the, and the localities, right? So we, we increase money for school safety that, that we voted on that, that has passed. But you also need, there are levels and layers of authority, right? Same thing with guns. A lot of things, you know, when, when this argument with your guns, whether you're for or against guns or whatever, Second Amendment, it's not just the federal government. Right? There, there's state, there's, there's local authorities that, that deal with those things. To me, and, and look, I, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment because I don't believe that the Second Amendment is for hunting. I don't believe it's for uh, target practice. It's for overthrowing a potentially uh, a, a tyrannical government. Now, that sounds outdated. I, I understand that. However, I've been, like I said, I've been in a lot of countries. I've seen tyranny up close. Republicans and Democrats in Congress are completely content with giving money and arming Syrian citizens who are doing what? trying to overthrow a tyrannical government. They probably wish they had the Second Amendment before, right? So that being said, God forbid, and hopefully it never happens here, right? But I want, I, you know, history doesn't show that. We're very young as a republic, and history just doesn't show that. Now, I'm 100% cool and, and will uh, and act to trying to get guns out of people's hands that shouldn't have them. So, for example, the Texas gun shooting happens. It was an Air Force veteran who had been convicted who should not have had a gun. Period. The military, it turns out, had a policy. It was a policy that they would report to the FBI because, as you guys know, there's the military justice system, the private one, and they don't always match up, right? So what's felonious and what's not? Yes. So we, I, I did a, a bill with Tulsi Gabbard, Democrat from Hawaii, veteran, and we to mandate the military because you know we got to police our own up. You got, you know, you you got your, you failed to report thousands of people who have been convicted of certain things, domestic violence. Statistically, it shows people who committed domestic violence are more likely to commit gun violence. So, all about getting rid of people who are taking, you know, taking guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. There's another thing that I advocate for, 
and that is empowering the individual, right? So the and, and let me before I say that I want to preface this, just like with this freedom of speech or you know or the freedom of religion or the freedom of guns, it's a high burden, very high burden to take away people's rights that are law abiding, right? So that's the last thing that I think that you should do, and, and, and there's a lot of knee jerk reactions. So let's take take this thing. You mentioned automatic guns. Automatic guns are not on the streets unless you have a well, unless they're legal or you have like a very high uh, license license mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. You can't you can't get them right? So now, on the individual note, like look at the parking example. The kid, his friends, his teachers, his family knew that he was going to do something bad. They were saying, hey, this guy is going to do bad stuff. There has got to be the ability for individuals, just like if if if, if I was attacking you or something like that, you want to get a restraining order against me. And you can go to a judge and show evidence and show that I'm that I'm a danger to you. And then I can also go and say he's lying. Here's evidence and stuff like that. We gotta have we gotta have some way to for the individual to take action to either prevent someone from getting guns and it may perhaps even take it depending on what's happening. Um, I would support I would support that. I, I'm actually we're working on you know, working on something with somebody else up in up in D.C. at the time to, uh, now to figure out what that looks like. Um, but. I'm, I'm more than willing to act on things that I think that to take guns away from people who should not have them or prevent them from getting them, right? Um, but I'm also very strong and uh, opposed to, or I, I want to hold up a high bar for people to take away people's rights that are law abiding, sure. which I like the Second Amendment, for freedom of speech, all that stuff. Those are constitutional rights, and I mean they have to have a very high burden, you know. So, I hope that answers your question. It, it, it didn't. You said something just one second. Uh, 30 years I retired from the Norfolk Police Department. Every year I have to go, you know, we'll be going here in three weeks, we have to requalify in order to carry our concealed weapons, our, our duty weapons. I would cherish the fact for free to be able to go to my grandchildren's school and sit in there and make them all safe. So what's free interesting charge. about No, so I'll just do it just to keep me safe. So without guns, right now there is a, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, right now, the same group that came up to me that were worried about their kids have started this thing, one of the schools over here in Virginia Beach that I, that I think is fantastic, and it's dads volunteering. They don't have, not yet guns, perhaps that will be sometime in the future, something like that, but they, but a dad is volunteering, and, and it filled up very quickly. Just goes around and sort of walks around the school, checks the doors, makes sure everything's fine, something like that, and walks around the school, and it's been wildly successful in, in, in that in that school district, and they're, we we're trying to advocate for them to make that more broad yeah. around the schools, you know. So, All right, thank you very yes, much. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, flooding and sea level rise is a pretty big issue here. I didn't even know that. So. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what can be done to find solutions for our sure. local area uh, to address this problem? Fantastic question. So, you know, there, there's all this political argument, okay, climate change, how much does man do, what can man do about it, all that stuff. Hey, man, the reality is we have sea level rise. So... There are soundings that are 50 years old off the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, and what does it tell you? There's sea level rise. So we have problems with outdated um, uh, drainage, you know, in the city, which causes recurrent flooding. Norfolk's got a problem because they're subsiding at the same time that sea level's rising. So we have we have issues. The military bases, the Navy will tell you there's been studies they're they're at risk. So we have to do something. You know, you have to have solutions. Um, number one, we have, and I won't tell, I won't say to you that I have a one size fit all. This is the solution. What I think what has to happen because I think Norfolk got a grant and my numbers are a little off so don't hold me to it but it was like it was a ridiculous amount of money like 100 million bucks and it helped like 30 homes. If you extrapolate that across the, the, our country, there's not enough money in the whole world to be able to, to deal with those things. So you have to come up with with actual entrepreneurial type solutions um, that that work for resiliency. One of the things that my office is doing, and we're going to have a bill, uh, we already have a bill, and it will be marked up within a month or so, is creating a national, designated national centers of excellence for sea level rise. As you can imagine, ODU and William & Mary, they're jumping all over it, and they want to be that. Because if they have that, then you can have, potentially get research dollars to help with that, as well as create economic clusters and businesses that understand how to, how to uh, create resiliency. That could work not just here, but also be exported service-wise around the around the coast and per, perhaps around the world. So I want I want our area to lead on that because after Louisiana, we're like number two in the, in, the, in the country that has a big problem with that. So I don't have a one-size-fit-all solution, but I think that the the answer can't just come from giving dollars because there's not enough dollars to deal with it. So it's there's, it's going to have to be public-private partnership stuff, entrepreneurial stuff, type stuff that helps with resiliency. On the basis, however. There, you know that 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 is something that dollars-wise we want to we want to keep them, and I will be fighting to to keep them. And in 
NOB and these other ones, you know, they, we have, they have to get the dollars they need, military construction type stuff, to be able, able to be resilient. In addition, we're working on a bill right now. So, for example, in Na Norfolk Naval Base, it's not just a base, but it's the road coming in, right? And the Norfolk Naval Base, the, the, the military can't really do anything about the road outside. So we need to figure out a solution to help with the road so that sailors can get on and off the base, you know, and, and you don't, we don't potentially lose the base because of that. Does that make sense? So does that answer your question roughly? It does. Yeah. I think the, the Center for Excellence is a great idea. Sure. Thank I you. think that's a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I went to the uh, Civic Seat, Civic Seat meeting and <coughs> mentioned that at the end of July, I think it is, the federal um, flood insurance program might not continue or it might continue for five years or so? So we just, I just, we just voted to renew it. You did? Yeah, that was, um, I, I, was out, my staff's not here, I, can, I can give you the, the, the data and stuff like that, what it was, I just, it escapes me right now, but we just voted to reauthorize flood insurance. And, yeah. That was, I think that was last year, if I'm not mistaken. There's been so many, so many, so many stuff. There are some places that, the last one that we had, um, Subdivisions flooded, trees flooded, mine was one of them. Luckily, my side is a little higher than, unfortunately, the neighbors where they got all damaged. Yeah. And our insurance um, said where we live, we, they didn't offer us flood insurance. And so my neighbors, eight houses, flooded. And they, weren't, they didn't have flood insurance because their insurance told them they were unable to get it. So, so that was part of the re I agree. Us. So that, that was part of the debate this past year or two was, was how do you look at the overlays? In flood zones and what's where where that's changed and if it's outdated or not. And I think that I don't know where they are on that, but um, I'm I'm happy to run that down too and, and figure it out. But I, but I agree because the, the, the there are things change. Th you know things change uh, with where you need flood insurance, where you don't need flood insurance, and so on. Yes, sir. How you doing? Um, first of all, thank you for your service. Uh, my pleasure. Much my uh, brother-in-law in Afghanistan too many times. But on the you know, the job of the congressman, so I'm curious, as far as, I'm an expert in inequality. I've been for studying it for over 20 years. So we know now today in America, we've yeah. never seen a gap between the poor So we are really on the cusp of the years perilous. So then I'm curious, how we can pass this budget that really is another version of the government. Failed in hand. The budget was written up. There was, people, there was tons of people all over Twitter, all over Facebook. And we got 24 hours to read this bill. So the congressional budget comes out and they have a $1.2 billion deficit. Then they just redid their numbers. Now they say it's one point seven. So to everyone's point, you know, we're worried about global warming, climate change, whatever we like to call it, issues with our roads, waterways, etc. We know that the American Society of Civil Engineers essentially came out with a report in 2017 that says we're at about $2.3 trillion deficit for taking care of America. Their grade for America's infrastructure, right, was a D plus. So that's not good. I don't know if anybody, right, that's not good. Sure. Right? So then I'm just curious then how how can you or what, what information, what research would you be able to use or why did you guys pause in the bill before you voted it? Because if I'm looking at a one point seven trillion dollar deficit based on the taxes that were just passed. Are you speaking hold on a second because I think uh, are you speaking about the budget, the spending bill, or the, the budget, taxes? The budget that was put in place. The because one what's gonna happen is if they reduce everyone's taxes. 2025, middle class voters are going to lose it, but the corporation tax rate will keep in place. Which is important, okay. well, actually. Well, actually, but what research shows us, and again, I'm an expert on this, so it's not the point of debate, is that in Kansas, they didn't hire people. No, the, rich, the rich kept their money, they invested in their corporations, just like we just read the other day, that all these corporations are shaking all their money and just buying stock. They're just reinvesting in well, because, because if I ran a business, why would I hire anybody unless there's a demand? I wouldn't. I would just take an investment in my company. I buy more cars. I do whatever. So, so I'm just curious sure. that we say that the money's not out there, right? But we have a 2.3 trillion dollar plus shortfall within our infrastructure, and then somehow magically we just hit 1.7. We're adding 1.7 trillion dollars to our deficit over the next decade. So I would want to know 
how can you justify it? Sure. Especially being a fiscal conservative. Absolutely. So, but I, I still think that you're, you're, there are three things that you're, you're talking about tax, the tax reform, which is a separate bill from, from the, but it well, takes into account for the So, so yes. So your yes. tax reform wasn't your reform. It was kind of a shell. I are losing money and we're doing whatever. I just, because, well, because, well, let me know, let me know when you're done. We, we, well, because here's the point. We can debate it, but the research and the history tells us that this is not going to work again. Because it didn't work in Kansas, it didn't work in 2001, it didn't work in the 80s, it just doesn't work. And so, so it it's not really a point of debate whether or not it'll work because it's not going to work. All right, so I disagree with you. Okay. Uh, okay. Of course. So what research are you citing? I, I know, but would you like me to answer your question? Yes, I'm just like what research you're citing. I'm so curious. I'm not citing any research. What I'm saying, philosophically. Let me finish what I'm going to say. Philosophically. Okay. Would you like to keep talking? I'll finish when you're I'm ready. Just, I'm just curious what philosophically means. Like, if you let me talk, then I'll answer your question. So I, I'm a, as I am a fiscal conservative, I'm a small government guy. I think we have a big spending problem. I think that we have the, one of the fastest driver of the debt is is not discretionary spending. It's not. It's not. It's automatic spending. And unfortunately, and this is where I kind of disagree with the president a little bit because I think that he doesn't want to he doesn't want to tackle that in his first term, doesn't want to touch it. I don't think that you can get on the trajectory where you need to be without touching it. I just don't. So, you know, I understand that you want me to cite research and stuff like that. That that's fine, but I don't I don't agree with where we are trajectory-wise spending with automatic spending. And I do think that you should be able to keep more of your money in your pocket. 100%. I do think that our corporations need to have competitive and you mentioned corporations. Who owns corporations? We do. Most of us do. You Most of us that's, do. That's actually a fallacy. The no, majority, it's not. The majority of people. That's who wrong. Make the major, that, this isn't a point of debate. The no, it is a point of debate. Well, well then why ask people them? People who make money in stock. Well, if you market, know the answer, you should run. Well, run you know this. what? If I had enough money, then I would. But here's the yeah. point. The majority of people who make their living, they make their money off the stock market are the top 20% of Americans. Right? No, that's no, not necessarily. Wrong. No. Is, Anybody have stocks in the retirement fact. here? That is a fact. Anybody have stocks in the retirement here? Okay. I'm you own about, companies so too. Would you want about, your? Would you? Would you like your? Hold on a second. Uh, would you right. like your corporations to be more competitive to be able to return investment on your for your money? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. So here comes the, the studies point. that so, you were citing. Academics. No, the okay, it's not, it's not, it's not a reference. Peace Excuse me. Whatever what that means. To some what people. makes academic unfallible? Science isn't infallible, but you know what it is. It is, and you should always strive we have, to improve it. It is the best answers that we have today. Science, so, science so, so, so the point is, is that you're saying that people are going to be investing in the stock market. The majority of, of average, everyday Americans do not invest in the stock market because they do not yes. have the capital to do a science. Things that were proven now, stock now, scientifically years ago has been disproven. So everything that has been proven it, academically, of course it but who could, economically, so, so let me ask you a question. Yeah. So in the last... Three years, how much have you studied the state of the gap between the rich and poor? <coughs> you have. Do you that's my point? Let me ask you let me, let me ask you a question on that. Yes, that's a great that's a great that's a great question. And, and I and I, I don't want this to, to deteriorate, right? I, I, don't, I mean, I'll, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy. I'm happy to have coffee with you and discuss this. And, hold on a second. Do you think that you think that some of the some of the gap is simply because of, of giving people back more of their own money? Really, the inequality gap? That's, you're giving people. Do you think a that? A minute amount of money. When the, when the significant difference between the rich and poor. A minute amount of money. Okay. So but the government so can't know, the government so can't fix that inequality. There can be things that can be done to do so. But some some of the things that are, are some of the inequality gap isn't solely just policies, right? It's also technology. You're, it's changes. You're that, right. You, I would completely agree. I'm with happy you on to that. sit down and do. I would completely agree with you on that. How about we do this? How about we do this? You and I. Hold on a second. You and I, so that we don't take everybody else's time up and have this right. debate. Let's have a coffee. Let's let's talk about let's talk about Sounds policies. Good. I would love to. And I'm happy to do that. I More than happy. Office last week. I'm waiting to hear back. Well, I'm, I got 750,000 constituents, so I know that I'm, you're, you're as important as anybody else, and, but I'm happy to meet with you whenever we have time. We haven't had a time on over a year. You're supposed to, when you ran, you said, I'm not going to be the guy who's going to dodge the hard questions. I don't. But you haven't had a time on over a year. All right, so let me, let me, just, let me answer that question. That's a, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Somebody else brought it up the other night, too, right? So if you came to my town hall in Kempsville mm -hmm. before, 
Well, you had or, to get in. Hold on. Get in. I know you tried to get in. Could you get in? Hell no, you couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So do you think that I want to hold those types of things that don't allow you to ask me questions and talk to me? No, I don't. L let me finish my, my point, please. Okay. So when I have organizations, because I saw them on, organizing on Facebook, they got there early, they, did, they, they were there only to disrupt. There were, like, it's a playbook for, for disruption. I'm not playing by the rules, brother. Sorry. Not going to happen. I want to have conversations with people. I want to, I'll answer any question to anybody about anything. I have no problem with that. And I damn sure am not afraid to sit in front of constituents. I'm happy to do with unruly crowds with AK-47s in the middle of the desert in Yemen. You think I care about people yelling and screaming? Hold on a second. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. So that, that being said, that being said, I'm not going to play by the rules. I'm going to hold these events all over the place, and I've, I've, met, I've had over a thousand meetings. If you want to shadow me, I hope I, I, come on, shadow me. Over a thousand, hold on a second. Over a thousand meetings with people, businesses, groups, events over over the last year. It's all documented, documented. So me going to a town hall and having pe and, and and having people disrupt and being more disrespectful than any kids I've met with, even about shootings. That, that harm your ability to ask me questions, I'm not going to subject all you to it. Not going to happen. So you want to see me, we'll set up a meeting, we'll do it, happy to do it. I'm not going to hold town halls that have, have in a place that allow people to go there and disrupt and, and harm everybody else's ability to talk to their congressman. Not going to happen, brother. Sorry. So, so are town halls not part of your responsibility? Is, that what the are, is it in the job description? No, is it? I don't know. No. It's, no, it's no. Not. no, it's not. Okay. But I want to, it's not, it's not in my job description to have a town hall in a public place to allow for people to come and disrupt it and, and be disruptive. It's just not. So so I know I know that in our side and I know that you know we'll have some things and they'll attack me for town halls, but the, here's the thing. People see me all over this all over this district. They've talked to me, they know me. We're gonna have these things more. We have we've had thirty of these these types of events and we're gonna have a bunch more. So we're gonna have our town halls and we're gonna talk to people and we're gonna do it in a way that allows people to be respectful for everyone else in my constituents. Sorry that you don't like me to do that, but I'm happy to uh, meet with you anytime, whenever we can fit on schedule. Yes, ma'am. After 9-11, it was stated in the media that one of the problems was that different agencies didn't talk to each other. And so this one knew something was coming, and that one knew something was coming, but they didn't coordinate. Sure. Now, um, this past year, I was at a meeting where the speaker was from the FBI, and I asked the question about that, and he said, well, it's better now, but it's on a need-to-know basis. I want to know, how does the FBI what, know what the CIA needs to know, and vice versa? Shouldn't there be coordination? There's no question about it. I think that you, you've, seen, you've seen a lot more coordination amongst agencies post 9-11. There's no question about that, but we still have a long way to go. We still have a long way to go in terms of flat, flat communication. There's no, there's no question about it. And when you look at some of the, some of the, some of the problems that, some of the threats of today, it, it, there, there still are some uh, silos. I mean, the fact that an example is sure. not communicating the way that they should be communicating. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but I, I will say that post 9/11, it's a lot better than it was. It was a lot worse before. And in this type of world now, where you have, you know, digital disruption and, and the type of threats that are out there, all the network threats and stuff like that, you need way more of it, 100% more of it. You know, that, that, those networks that contribute to the income and quality and stuff. Mr. Taylor. Yes, sir. Uh, name's Eric Murray, and the question, I thank you for your service, and I thank you for what your family did so you could do what you did. Uh, saying that, the opioid and heroin and fentanyl, and with it being so prevalent, and I understand that you might even be closer to the situation with, you know, recent events. But can you touch on that as far as? Yeah, I mean, like I think, you know, again, from the federal level, there's a lot, there's policies, but there's also money, right, for programs, stuff like that. And, and there's been increased funding there. The state level, they're really on the front lines in terms of policy for, for doctors and prescription and pres prescribing certain things. When I was in the state house, I tried to pass a law that, I think it's now, it's not the specific law, but it's now in place, and it was shortening the time when, when doctors prescribe uh, opiate-based drugs, which are gateway drugs. Mm -hmm. You hear, you know, marijuana being a gateway drug. No, it's Percocets and stuff like that, right? Um, to get them in, in the system to be tighter when they, the, the, if they have to prescribe to somebody for a certain amount of time, 
that it gets reported earlier, right, so that we can monitor those things better. Those types of things, that there's been a lot of push there at the state level. There's also a push at the federal level. There's been more funding that's been authorized. But it's a big problem. It's a big problem um, not just for, for those types of policies, but when you have fentanyl and, um, and heroin coming over from China in shipping. And as you can imagine, not all containers are checked, right? It's like a ton, like a very small percentage of containers are checked. And there's the demand here. So that stuff's coming over from China. It's coming over from Mexico. Um, you, we, have to be, we have to do a lot better job on the, on the, on, around the shipping security as well as border security for it. But, it, it, you know, I wish that I had some solution that could just stop that. But the reality is I don't. And the reality is it's, it's, it's been getting worse. But, yes, there are, there are a lot of smart people who are thinking about it. A lot of, there are a lot of policies being created to deal with this issue because it is a huge issue in our country. And it affects all different socioeconomic backgrounds and people. And, uh, I mean, I'm willing to do whatever I can. I wish I could stop it, but I just can't. Because we're hearing stuff as, uh, let's say, five of the heroin individuals get together. All of a sudden, they have a designated driver, a designated Narcon giver. So the four of them do their yeah. heroin, and then if any one of them goes, you know, hooked up, then in turn the designated driver, and then not to mention the fentanyl. I mean, locally, I mean. Yeah, I mean, at the state level, we gave law enforcement officers Narcon, right, to be able to deal with ODs, which is mm -hmm. terrible that you have to do that. Um, How many times do you respond to the same individual when they know that they're going to be revived after they do yeah. their I mean, the interesting thing is, and I, I just I wish I had I wish I had time to be able to, you know, America's had an opium, an opium problem before in the late 1800s, and you know, they, you know, there were a lot of people that were really hooked on that stuff a long time ago. So it'd be interesting to see, I, and, I, and I haven't done the research, but what what did we do? What how do we how do we deal with that problem, which was very pervasive in American society in the, in the 1800s with opium? Um, I don't know if it was super strict laws or what, or, or, or punishments or what. I just don't. I don't know. And I like to Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, hey, look, we got to wrap it up, guys. Again, I thank you, all of you. I really appreciate your questions. I do. Um, and I appreciate your time to coming out here. So if, if there's anything we can do to help out in our office, don't hesitate to reach out. And um, it's an honor to serve you. So thank you very much. And we, have, we do have an election June 12th, and we have one in November. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you.
house and, and, and buildings. So if there's an active shooter and it's a school, and okay, on the west side, on the second floor, there's a shooting. But you might not hear it on the first floor on the east side, right? But those sensors, within one second, boom, it is a gun, uh, it is a gunshot, and that's where the shooter is. And because of software, you can go to everyone's cell phone, all the computers, and tell you what to do. And you can have drills just like you would in a fire drill or something like that. Plus, you can go to law enforcement immediately, so they, so it saves time, therefore saves lives, mm -hmm. right? So th that's something I, that I had a bill, actually, in, in the Virginia House of Delegates for new schools. You know, Virginia Beach, we got great schools. You guys have seen them. They're pretty expensive to build. You could probably go down one level on the sconce of the lighting and have, and have this. It's not that expensive to put in. Um, and, and on that note, the we also, in Virginia, we incent, want to incentive, incentivize localities to put retired law enforcement, military, in, in, the, in the school. So I'm not an advocate of you know someone walking around the day of school with it with a big gun or something like that, but a potentially concealed. And, and, and what I don't, the gun-free zone, I, I agree with the president on this. Why would you have a gun? We protect politicians. We protect our money. We protect celebrities with guns, or at least the, the notion that, that you, someone might have a gun. Why would we not protect our most precious resources in the same way? It makes no sense to me. So, uh, but, but on that note, that, so there are also, what have we done? So we've, we have, uh, in the Congress, because a lot of things the feds do, of course, is, is give money. And then it goes down to the states, and they, and they do their policies, and then the, and the localities, right? So we, we increase money for school safety that, that we voted on that has passed. But you also need, there are levels and layers of authority, right? Same thing with guns. A lot of things, you know, when this argument with your guns, whether you're for or against guns or whatever, Second Amendment, it's not just the federal government, right? There, there's state, there's, there's local authorities that, that deal with those things. To me, and, and look, I, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment because I don't believe that the Second Amendment is for hunting. I don't believe it's for uh, target practice. It's for overthrowing a potentially uh, a, a tyrannical government. Now, that sounds outdated. I, I understand that. However, I've been, like I said, I've been in a lot of countries. I've seen tyranny up close. Republicans and Democrats in Congress are completely content with giving money and arming Syrian citizens who are doing what? Trying to overthrow a tyrannical government. They probably wish they had the Second Amendment before, right? So that being said, God forbid, and hopefully it never happens here, right? But I want, I, you know, history doesn't show that. We're very young as a republic, and history just doesn't show that. Now, I'm 100% cool and, and will uh, and act to trying to get guns out of people's hands that, that shouldn't have them. So, for example, the Texas gun shooting happens. It was an Air Force veteran who had been convicted who should not have had a gun, period. The military, it turns out, had a policy. It was a policy that they would report to the FBI because, as you guys know, there's the military justice system, the private one, and they don't always match up, right? So what's felonious and what's not? Yes. So we, I, I did a, a bill with Tulsi Gabbard, Democrat from Hawaii, veteran, and we to mandate the military. Because you know we got to police our own up. You got you know you you you're, you fail to report thousands of people who have been convicted of certain things, domestic violence. Statistically, it shows people who commit domestic violence are more likely to commit gun violence. So, all about getting rid of people who are taking you know, taking guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them. There's another thing that I advocate for, and that is empowering the individual, right? So the and, and let me before I say that I want to preface this, just like with this freedom of speech. Or, you know, or the freedom of religion, or the freedom of guns. It's a high burden, very high burden, to take away people's rights that are law-abiding, right? So that's the last thing that I think that you should do. And, and, and there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions. So there's take, take this thing. You mentioned automatic guns. Automatic guns are not on the streets unless you have a, well, unless they're legal, or you have, like, a very high uh, license license mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. You, can't, you can't get them, right? So now, on the individual note, like, look at the parking example. The kid... His friends, his teachers, his family knew that he was going to do something bad. And they were saying, hey, this guy is going to do bad stuff. There has got to be the ability for individuals, just like if, if, if I was attacking you or something like that, you want to get a restraining order against me, and you can go to a judge and show evidence and show that I'm, that I'm a danger to you, and then I can also go and say, hey, he's lying, here's evidence, or stuff like that. We've got to have, we've got to have some way to, for the individual to take action, to either prevent someone from getting guns, and it may perhaps even take it, depending on what's happening. Um, I would support. I would support that. I, I'm actually we're working on you know working on something with somebody else up in up in D.C. at the time to, uh, now to figure out what that looks like. Um, but I'm I'm more than willing to act on things that I think that to take guns away from people who should not have them or prevent them from getting them. Right. Um, but I'm also very strong and uh, opposed to or I, I want to hold up a high bar for people to take away people's rights that are law abiding. Sure. Which I like the Second Amendment, 
for freedom of speech, all that stuff, those are constitutional rights. And, I mean, they have to have a very high burden to develop. So, I hope that answers your question. You it, it, it didn't. You said something just one second. Uh, 30 years I retired from the Norfolk Police Department. Every year I have to go, uh, we'll be going here in three weeks, you have to requalify in order to carry a concealed weapon or, or duty weapon. I would cherish the fact for free to be able to go with my grandchildren to school and sit in there and make them all safe. So what's free charge. Here, no, so I'll just do it just to keep them safe. So without guns, right now there is a, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, right now, the same group that came up to me that were worried about their kids have started this thing, one of the schools over here in Virginia Beach that I, that I think is fantastic, and it's dads volunteering. They don't have, not yet guns, perhaps that will be sometime in the future, something like that, but they, but a dad is volunteering, and, and it filled up very quickly. Just goes around and sort of walks around the school, checks the doors, makes sure everything's fine, something like that, and walks around the school, and it's been wildly successful in, in, in that in that school district, and they're we we're trying to advocate for them to make that more broad yeah. around the schools, you know. So, All right, thank you very yes, much. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, flooding and sea level rise is a pretty big issue here. I didn't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, what can be done to find solutions for our sure. local area uh, to address this problem? Fantastic question. So, you know, there, there's all this political argument, okay, climate change, how much does man do, what can man do about it, all that stuff. Hey, man, the reality is we have sea level rise. So... There are soundings that are 50 years old off the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, and what does it tell you? There's sea level rise. So we have problems with outdated um, uh, drainage you know, in the city, which causes recurrent flooding. Norfolk's got a problem because they're subsiding at the same time that sea level's rising. So we have, we have issues. The military bases, the Navy will tell you there's been studies, they're, they're at risk. So we have to do something. You, know, you have to have solutions. Um, number one, we have, and I won't, tell, I won't say to you that I have a one-size-fit-all, this is the solution. What I think what has to happen, because I think Norfolk got a grant, and my numbers are a little off, so don't hold me to it, but it was like it was a ridiculous amount of money, like $100 million bucks, and it helped like 30 homes. If you extrapolate that across the, the, our country, there's not enough money in the whole world to be able to, to deal with those things. So you have to come up with, with actual entrepreneurial type solutions um, that, that work for resiliency. One of the things that my office is doing, and we're going to have a bill, uh, we already have a bill, and it will be marked up within a month or so, is creating a national, designated National Center of Excellency for sea level rise. As you can imagine, ODU and William & Mary, they're jumping all over it, and they want to be that. Because if they have that, then you can have, potentially get research dollars to help with that, as well as create economic clusters and businesses that understand how to, how to uh, create resiliency. That could work not just here, but also be exported service-wise around the, around the coast and perhaps around the world. So I want, I want our area to lead on that because after Louisiana, we're like number two in, in, in the country that has a big problem with that. So I don't have a one-size-fit-all solution, but I think that the, the answer can't just come from giving dollars because there's not enough dollars to deal with it. So it's, there's, it's going to have to be public-private partnership stuff, entrepreneurial stuff, type stuff that helps with resiliency. On the basis, however... There, you know, that 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 is something that dollars-wise we want to we want to keep them, and I will be fighting to to keep them. And in NOB and these other ones, you know, we, they we have they have to get the dollars they need, military construction type stuff, to be able able to be resilient. In addition, we're working on a bill right now. So, for example, in Na Norfolk Naval Base, it's not just a base, but it's the road coming in, right? And the Norfolk Naval Base, the, the, the military can't really do anything about the road outside. So we need to figure out a solution to help with the road so that sailors can get on and off the base, you know, and, and you don't, we don't potentially lose the base because of that. Does that make sense? So does that answer your question roughly? It does. Yeah. I think the, the Center for Excellence is a great idea. Sure. Thank I think you. that's a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I went to the uh, Civic Suite, the Civic Suite meeting, and I <coughs> mentioned that at the end of July, I think it is, the federal um, flood insurance program might not continue or it might continue. So we just, I just, re we just voted to renew it. You did? Yeah, that was. Um, I can, my staff not here either. I can, I can give you the, the, the data and stuff like that. When it was, I just, it escapes me right now. But we just voted to reauthorize flood insurance. Fantastic. That was, I think that was last year, if I'm not mistaken. There's been so many back so many, so many stuff. The places that sort of the last one that we had. Um, Subdivisions flooded, trees flooded, mine was one of them. Luckily, my side is a little higher than unfortunate neighbors where they got all damage. Yeah. And our insurance um, said where we live, we didn't offer flood insurance. And so my neighbors, eight houses flooded, and they weren't 
didn't have home insurance because their insurance told them they were unable to get it. So, so that was part of the agree. Well. So that that was part of the debate this past year too was was how did you look at the overlays and, and flood zones and what's where where that's changed if it's outdated or not. I think that I don't know where they are on that, but I'm I'm, I'm happy to run that down too and, and figure it out. But I but I agree because the, the there are things change. Mm -hmm. You know things change uh, with where you need flood insurance, where you don't need flood insurance, and so on. Yes, sir. Um, First of all, thank you for your service. Oh, my pleasure. Much appreciated. My uh, brother-in-law is in Afghanistan, so he's on the town. But on to you know, the job of the congressman. So I'm curious, as far as I'm an expert in enthralling, which is for me. That's my team. We study it for over 20 years. So we know now today in America, we've never seen a gap in transition for us since the 13th century. So we are really on the cusp. So then I'm curious how we can pass a budget that really is another version of economic hindsight, failed infrastructure, failed enhancements. The budget was written up. There was, there was tons of people all over Twitter, all over Facebook. We've got 24 hours to read this thing. So the congressional budget comes out and they have a $1.2 billion deficit. This is going to lead. Then they just redid their numbers. Now they say it's so to everyone's point, you know, we're worried about global warming, climate change, and everyone's like calling the issues with our roads, waterways, etc. We know that the American Society of Civil Engineers essentially came out with a report in 2017 that said we're at about $2.3 trillion deficit for taking care of America. They're great for America's infrastructure, right? It was a D plus. So that's not good. I don't know if anybody, right? That's not good to see. Sure. Right? So then I'm just curious then how how can you or what, what information, what research would you be able to use or why didn't you guys pause in the bill before you voted it? Because if I'm looking at a one point seven trillion dollar deficit based on the taxes that would be passed. Are you speaking hold on a second, because I think are you speaking about the budget, the spending bill, or the, the taxes? Budget, the budget that was put in place. The because one what's gonna happen is if they reduce everyone's taxes, twenty twenty five middle class voters are gonna lose it, but the corporation tax rate will Place. Which is important, okay. well, actually. Well, actually, but what research shows us, and again, I'm an expert on this, so it's not the point of debate, is that in Kansas, they didn't hire people. No, the, rich, the rich kept their money, they invested in their corporations, just like we just read the other day, that all these corporations were shaking all their money and just buying stock. They were just reinvesting well, themselves. Because, because if I ran a business, why would I hire anybody unless there's a demand? I wouldn't. I would just take an investment in my company. Buy more cars, I do whatever. So, so I'm just curious sure. that we say that the money's not out there, right? But we have a $2.3 trillion dollar plus shortfall within our infrastructure. And then somehow, magically, we just need a $1.7 trillion. We're adding $1.7 trillion to the deficit over the next decade. So I would want to know how can you justify that, sure. especially being a fiscal conservative? Absolutely. So, but I, I still think that you're, you're, there are three things that you're, you're talking about tax, the tax reform, which is a separate bill, right? From the, but it, but it takes into account for the So, so yes. So your, your tax reform wasn't really reform. It was kind of a shelter. We're moving money and we're doing whatever. I just, well, because, well, let me know, let me know when you're done. We, we, well, because here's the point. We can debate it, but the research and the history tells us that this is not going to work again. Because it didn't work in Kansas, it didn't work in 2001, it didn't work in the 80s, it just doesn't work. And so, so it it's not really a point of debate whether or not it will work because it's not going to work. All right, so I disagree with you. Okay. Uh, you know, of course. So what research are you studying? I, I know, but would you like me to answer your question? Yes, I'd just like to know what research you're citing. I'm so curious. I'm not citing any research. What I'm saying, philosophically, let me finish what I'm going to say. Philosophically. Okay. Would you like to keep talking? I'll finish when you're I'm ready. Just, I'm just curious what philosophically means. If you let me talk, then I'll answer your question. So, I'm a, as I am a fiscal conservative, I'm a small government guy. I think we have a big spending problem. I think that we have the, well, the fastest driver of the debt is is not discretionary spending. It's not. It's not. It's automatic spending. And unfortunately, and this is where I kind of disagree with the president a little because I think that he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to tackle that in his first term. Doesn't want to touch it. I don't think that you can get on the trajectory where you need to be without touching it. I just don't. 
So, you know, I understand that you want me to cite research and stuff like that. That's fine. But I don't agree with where we are trajectory-wise spending with automatic spending. And I do think that you should be able to keep more of your money in your pocket, 100%. I do think that our corporations need to have competitive. And you mentioned corporations. Who owns corporations? We do. Most of us do. Most of us do. That's actually a fallacy. No, it's not. The majority of people. That's wrong. This isn't a point of debate. No, it is a point of debate. Well, then why ask them? People who make money in stock. Well, if you know the answer, you should run. Well, you know what? If I had enough money, then I would. But here's the point. The majority of people who make their living, they make their money off the stock market, the top 20% of America. Right? No, no, not necessarily. No. Anybody have stocks in retirement here? That is a fact. Anybody have stocks in retirement here? Okay. You own companies too. Would you want your? Would you? Would you like your? Hold on a second. Would you like your corporations to be more competitive? To be able to return investment on your for your money? Absolutely. Of course. Find the studies that you are citing. Academics. Economists. No, academics aren't self-funded. People who have these prizes. Excuse me. Whatever that means. What makes academics? Unfallible. Science isn't infallible, but you know what it and is. It is, and you should always strive we have, to improve it. It is the best answers that we have today. Science, so, science so, has so the point is, is that you're saying that people are going to be investing in the stock market. The majority of, of average everyday Americans do not invest in the stock market because they do not yes. have the capital to do it. Things that were proven stock now, now, scientifically years ago have been disproven. Look, Everything that has been proved academically, but who could economically? So, so let me ask you a question. Yeah. So in the last three years, how much have you studied the state of the gap between the rich and poor? <laughs> you have. Do you? That's my point. Let me ask. Let me, let me ask you a question on that. That's a great. That's a great. That's a great question. And, and, I, and I, I don't want this to, to deteriorate, right? I, I, don't, I mean, I'll, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to. I'm happy. I'm happy to have coffee with you and discuss this. And, hold on a second. Do you think that you think that some of the some of the gap is simply because of, of giving people back more of their own money? Really, the inequality gap? That's, you're giving people do you think a minute that? amount of money when the when the significant difference is between the rich and poor. A minute a amount small. of money. Okay, so but the okay, government so can't know, the government so can't fix that inequality. There can be things that can be done to do so, but some some of the things that are, are some of the inequality gap isn't solely just policies, right? It's also technology. You're, it's changes. You're that, right. I would completely agree I'm with you. I'm happy to sit down and do it. I would completely agree with you on that. How about we do this? How about we do this? You and I. Hold on a second. You and I, so that we don't take everybody else's time up and have this right. debate. Let's have a coffee. Let's let's talk about let's talk about Sounds the policies. Good. I would love to. And I'm happy to do that. I More than happy. Your office last week. I'm waiting to hear back. Well, I'm s i am got seven hundred fifty thousand constituents. So I know that I'm, you're you're as important as anybody else. I know. And but, but I'm happy to meet with you whenever we have time. We haven't had a time on over a year. You're supposed to, when you ran, you said I'm not gonna be the guy who's gonna dodge the hurt. I don't. Would you have an Amazon hold over here? All right, so let me let me just let me answer that question. That's a, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Somebody else brought it up the other night too, right? So, if you came to my town hall in Kempsville mm-hmm. before, where you had I tried to get in. hold on, I know you tried to get in. Could you get in? Hell no, you couldn't get in. Mm-hmm. So, do you think that I want to hold those types of things that don't allow you to ask me questions and talk to me? No, I don't. Let, let me finish my, my point, please. Okay. So. When I have organizations, because I saw them on, organizing on Facebook, they got there early. They did. They, they were there only to disrupt. There were like the playbook for for disruption. I'm not playing by the rules, brother. Sorry, not gonna happen. I want to have conversations with people. I want to. I'll, I'll answer any question to anybody about anything. I have no problem with that. And I damn sure am not afraid to sit in front of constituents. I'm happy to do it with rural, unruly crowds with AK-47s in the middle of the desert in Yemen. You think I care about people yelling and screaming? Hold on a second. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. So that, that being said, that being said, I'm not going to play by the rules. I'm going to hold these events all over the place. And I've, I've, met, I've had over 1,000 meetings. If you want to shadow me, I hope I, I, come on, shadow me. Over a thou- Hold on a second. Over 1,000 meetings with people, businesses, groups, events over, over the last year. It's all documented. Document it. So me going to a town hall and having pe- and, and, and having people disrupt and being more disrespectful than any kids I've met with, even about shootings, that that harm your ability to ask me questions, I'm not going to subject all you to it. Not going to happen. So you want to see me, we'll set up a meeting, we'll do it, happy to do it. I'm not going to hold town halls that have, have in a place that allow people to go there and disrupt and, and harm everybody else's ability to talk to their congressman. Not going to happen, brother. Sorry. So, so are town halls not part of your 
Uh, uh, is it in the job description? No, no, is it? I don't no. Know. It's, it's, no, it's no. not. No, it's not. Okay. But yeah. I want to. It's not. It's not in my job description to have a town hall in a public place to allow for people to come and disrupt and, and, and be disrupted. It's just not. So, so I know. I know that in our side, and I know that you know we'll have some things, and they'll tag me for town halls. But the, here's the thing: people see me all over this, all over this district. They've talked to me. They know me. We're going to have these things more. We have, we've had 30 of these, these types of events, and we're going to have a bunch more. So we're going to have our town halls, and we're going to talk to people, and we're going to do it in a way that allows people to be respectful for everyone else in my constituents. Sorry that you don't like me to do that, but I'm happy to uh, meet with you anytime. Yes, ma'am. After 9-11, it was stated in the press that there was a lot of Respond to the same individual 
when they know that they're going to be revived after they do their – I mean, the interesting thing is, and I just – I wish I had – I wish I had time to be able to – you know, America's had an opium problem before in the late 1800s. And, you know, there were a lot of people that were really hooked on that stuff a long time ago. So it would be interesting to see – and I haven't done the research, but what did we do? How do we deal with that problem, which was very pervasive throughout American society in the 1800s with opium? I don't know if it was super strict laws or what – or punishments or what. I just don't – I don't know. And I'd like to – Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, hey, look, we've got to wrap it up, guys. Again, I thank you, all of you. I really appreciate your questions. I do. And I appreciate your time to coming out here. So if there's anything we can do to help out in our office, don't hesitate to reach out. And it's an honor to serve you. So thank you very much. And we do have an election June 12th, and we have one in November. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.